Our presenter today is Jeff Wolandowski. Jeff has over 20 years of experience in process control and particularly pressure regulators, control valves, and remote automation solutions. Jeff began his career with the Emerson Regulator Division as an application engineer before bringing his expertise to Novaspect, where for the past 15 years he's been leading several business units. His teams work across all industries to improve customer operations with the innovative application of technology, which includes today's discussion on tank blanketing. So welcome, Jeff. Thank you for being here and sharing your insights with us. Thank you, Robert. Again, my name is Jeff Wolandowski. I'm honored to be here this morning. Um, hopefully, everyone can hear me clearly and can see the, the screen clearly. If not, please uh, send a raise your hand message of some sort, and we'll see if we can fix that issue. wanted to uh, talk to you t this morning about tank blanketing. Uh, engineering the Solution is the title of our presentation. And what we're going to talk about today is going to cover several different topics around tank blanketing. We're going to talk about uh, why we want to use tank blanketing, uh, the engineering behind the, the pieces on the tank, um, some of the regulations involved that govern uh, the manufacturing of the tank, as well as uh, the government uh, regulations in terms of fugitive emissions and safety, et cetera. And then uh, we'll talk about the engineering parameters that are required by an integrator like Novaspec, where we can actually help engineer the solution and what type of information our teams would require so that we can put the proper solution around and on your tank as appropriate. So with that, with that backdrop in mind, let's, uh, let's get started into talking about tank blanketing in general. Here on the first slide, overhead, you should see industries using tank blanketing. And what we have here is uh, let me move that over. what we have here is several industries that are highlighted in red. These are common industries. Uh, these are industries that are commonly using tank blanketing systems. Chemical industry, for example, pharmaceutical, petrochemical, uh, also the refining industry for store products and fuels, etc. But you also see a variety of other uh, industries as well. Uh, the semiconductor industry, the food and beverage industry is very common in using tank blanketing for storing finished product and keeping uh, uh, spoilage to a minimum. Also fragrance, fragrances and uh, indus industrial coatings such as paints and inks and any of those types of uh, fluids that uh, would create some sort of volatile fume or safety hazard type fumes that could be uh, uh, vented to atmosphere. So these are some of the common industries that you see using tank blanketing. Our experience here at Novaspec, uh, we definitely see a lot of usage of tank blanketing on the three highlighted along the top as well as our refining industry and food and beverage. So let's, uh, let's get into, um, there we go. Let's talk about the tank system in general. So let's look at the process control that surround the tank in general. There are several systems that are used on the tank. And you can break it down into several different categories, such as the pumping system. Here is the pumping system that you see highlighted uh, on our graphic. Hopefully everyone can see the, the tank on the left. Uh, you can see it's labeled with the different systems throughout. You have a pumping in system as well as a pumping out system. This is a uh, very critical system in terms of uh, moving fluids in and out of the tank and will play a big part in our sizing process on how we use uh, that information to put the appropriate pad, D-pad type equipment along the top. We also have the uh, temperature control potentially. You may need to keep the fluid at a certain temperature uh, so that it can stay in a liquid form or that it can be pumped in and pumped out uh, uh, more easily easily. Uh, a steam loop or a steam jacket is very common and uh, here you see uh, a regulator using steam loop at the bottom of the tank keeping the fluid uh, at a certain temperature. Then there's gauging. There's, there's all types of different gauging that are used along the tanks. There's the fluid level gauging, temperature gauging, flow rate, pressures, etc. Gauging around tanks in our opinion is extremely important. Uh, the transmitters can also 
be used as an electronic type gauge feeding back into a digital control system. But uh, typical gauging, if, it's, if the tank is not tied back as an I.O. point back to a, to a control system, uh, generally you'll see a lot of these other types of gauging around as well. And then you have the tank blanketing system. And this is the top of the tank section that we're going to be spending a lot of time on today. We're going to be talking about the D-pad and the pad regulators. We're going to be talking about the conservation vents and the emergency relief vents. And we'll even touch briefly on some rupture disc. Uh, the gauging side, where here at the top of the tank, if you look at the graphic, you'll see a, a device that actually has a blue top to it. That's actually a radar type gauge. Uh, we are not going to be talking about that in particular in detail. We want to spend more time about on the pad, D-pad, and venting side of the system today. And then, like I mentioned before, in the, uh, the control system is uh, a computer system that controls the logic. Uh, it takes the data in from the gauging, from the valves, from digital controllers, uh, from uh, uh, transmitters, from flow transmitters, temperature transmitters, does the logic on when the pumps need to be turned on, turned off, and then sends the, uh, the outputs out to those uh, devices so that we can uh, automatically control the levels of the tank uh, as well as the blanketing pressures. So let's get started. Let's talk, in specific, let's talk specifically about the tank blanketing system. This is the system that consists of providing a gas delivery to maintain the pressure of the gas blanket as the temperature and liquid level in the tank varies. So in general, here this is where we're providing a system so that we can keep the form of the tank. Uh, for one, this is a very good reason to be using tank blanking is to keep the form of the tank. So as the liquid levels in the tank are being pumped in, the vapor space above that liquid level, especially on a closed roof tank, are being compressed. In that situation, the tank, depending upon how it's been designed, uh, we need to vent that excessive pressure off. Depending upon what we're storing in the tank, we may be allowed to vent it off the atmosphere, or we may have to recover that excessive pressure and scrub it, potentially send it to flare, or do something else with it like recycle. When we're unloading the tank or pumping out the tank, we're actually expanding that vapor space. And this is where the, pla the pad side comes into play or we're actually adding more of this inert gas or blanketing pressure into the tank to make up that vapor space. You may have remembered when you were a kid, after playing all day outside, coming into the house, pulling out the two liter bottle of pop or Coke or soda, depending upon what you may call it, uh, out of the refrigerator, putting your lips on it and sucking the fluid out of the, out of the, uh, out of the two liter bottle of pop. One of the first things you noticed, obviously, was that the bottle started to collapse. And uh, what we're trying to do here is, if you can think about the two-liter bottle of pop as being your tank, we're trying to prevent that collapse from happening uh, when we're unloading the tank. That's exactly where the padding comes into play. So we have three main categories, like we said. We have the pad side or the blanket side. We have the D-pad side or the vapor recovery side or pressure vents can be used in that form as well. And then you have the emergency venting or the, uh, the emergency protection against overpressure and uh, vacuum pressure. And we're going to talk about these three uh, main categories in a little bit more detail. So what is the pad side? So let's define what we mean by pad or the blanketing side. Pad, also called makeup, uh, is, uh, is sometimes the tank blanketing specifically mean pad. So in other words, blanketing or the pad is what we're using. And this is the process of maintaining a slightly, uh, slightly positive pressure in a closed storage tank. So we have a fixed roof tank here or a closed storage tank. And as the vessel or container it has the inert gas put in to preserve the, func the uh, functionality of the tank, we are sizing the pad regulator for the pump off rate and also the thermal contraction events that can ha happen through cooling. Uh, a pressure reducing regulator is typically used in this type of, it, in, in this type of uh, uh, application. You can use a control valve. Uh, pneumatically controlled valves have been used in the past. Uh, also, uh, uh, electro-pneumatic uh, control valves can be used. However, in a remote tank farm where there's a variety of different tanks, 
they may be off-site from the main plant. Uh, using I.O. and electric pneumatic uh, control valves is somewhat uncommon, or electrically operated control valves is somewhat uncommon. It's very common to see a self-contained regulator used as a padding device in these remote tank farms because they don't require any process power, uh, any uh, external power. They are all process powered or internally registering pressures, changes in the tank and adjusting accordingly. So if you look at, at the schematics that we have uh, for the tank blanketing system on the uh, pad side, you can see there's several different regulators highlighted there as well as uh, a couple graphics that are showing exactly what we're trying to do. One interesting note is on the bottom right-hand picture where it's tinted in green and shows the yellow, the orange and blue tank. You'll notice that tank blanketing regulator is upside down where you see the spring barrel turned upside down. It is very common for tank blanketing pressures to be very low in nature. Several inches of water column or even a fraction of an inch of water column. The reason that regulator is upside down is to achieve set points that low, typically weight of parts is taken out of the equation. So we will take the regulator and invert it so that the weight of the parts are out of the, uh, out of the factors of making set range and we can achieve those low pressure settings. Just something to point out there. So let's take a look at if you're considering using padding or blanketing which types of gases should be used for padding. These are the most commonly used gases that we see uh, when we're dealing with the tank blanketing system. Nitrogen tends to be the most commonly used, but we also have uh, handled many systems with carbon dioxide or even natural gas. Now most plants are not producing these types of gases, so nitrogen, carbon dioxide, natural gas. These are purchased gases either from a gas utility or a, a processed gas manufacturer. And so there's a cost associated with purchasing this, these blanketing gases and using them in this type of processing. So when considering the gases that you're going to be using, obviously cost is a big part of what, what we want to consider. There's also a couple other uh, factors that come into play, such as the compatibility of the gas that you're going to use for blanketing on the product that you're storing. You have to remember that there will be situations where you're not putting in uh, gas blanketing and you may not be taking it off. You may be in a static situation. And what's happening at that point is the fumes from, or the vapors from the stored uh, fluids in the tank are mixing with the nitrogen. You may have a constant purge, you may not. If you do not have a purge on your blanketing system, you're in a static state you're waiting for the thermal expansion or contraction and as these vapors are mixing together we have to decide if the nitrogen or the carbon dioxide or natural gas is compatible with uh, with the fluid being stored and the vapors being stored. It may create a worse situation with uh, incompatibility in terms of corrosion or even volatility. So what types of gases are compatible with your products? What are the costs of those gases? And then third, what we want to consider is how available are they? Natural gas is pretty darn available. Uh, most, most plants are located in an area where a natural gas distribution company or a pipeline type company is providing natural gas. Um, however, if you're in a remote area, getting nitrogen or carbon dioxide may be a little bit more of a challenge, but generally these gases are pretty readily. Okay, so we've talked about the padding side or where we're putting the gas blanketing pressure in. Let's talk about the D-pad side. The D-pad side is also called the vapor recovery side. And there's two ways of, of classifying this. You could say basically we're going to vent off to atmosphere and we could do that through a conservation vent um, or we could uh, D-pad or recover, I'm sorry, vapor recover this. And we could do that through a conservation vent as well, but what we're going to use in that situation is a pipe away vent where we're going to recover the vapor. We also have uh, regulators that are in back pressure mode, if you will, or relief constructed. And what we mean by that is they're typically in a spring to close type of, type of action. Under normal situation, they're closed. It takes pressure to open them. That's, that's very common with a relief valve, 
back pressure regulator basically doing the same type of function. On a pad side, going back to our previous topic, those are spring to open devices typically where it takes pressure to close them so they're normally open. So on the deep pad side, we're waiting for that pressure to build up in the tank so that we reach a certain set point to where we can vent it off. And we either vent it off to atmosphere, depending upon the volatility and the EPA standards around what we've got, or we're going to vapor recover. Now what are we going to do in vapor recovery? Well basically in this situation we may treat the fumes, the gases that are mixed in with the vapors from the stored liquid, and we may scrub it and then send it to flare, or we may recycle it. There may be, or we may use it for another processing. There's, there's a variety of ways of handling the vapor recovery side. One thing to note about vapor recovery, though, is that typically the gases on top of the tank are at a very low pressure. So you can imagine if you have, from a pad side, you might have 100 PSI G a supply of nitrogen, and you're cutting that down to, let's say, two inches of water column for blanketing pressure. That's quite a pressure drop. So depending upon the size of your tank, chances are your blanketing regulator doesn't need to be very large to provide a significant amount of volume given the pressure drop that you have. However, on the D-pad side, you have only two inches of water column of pressure in the tank, and you're going to be venting that off the atmosphere. A two inch of water column differential isn't much of a differential. In comparison, think about your exhale. Your exhale as you're sitting here breathing listening to this presentation is seven inches of water column. You're talking about roughly a third of your exhale as a blank pressure. That's not much pressure to get any kind of flow rate. So what's commonly used in vapor recovery is some sort of vacuum pump on the downstream side of the D-pad regulator. We use a vacuum pump to create differential so that we can increase the differential across the regulator and actually get more capacity across that D-pad regulator. So that's a very commonly used device on the D-pad side. Uh, you see it in that lower picture there again with the green background. That blue mass on the upper right-hand corner, that's a vacuum system or a vacuum pump on the outlet of the, uh, of the D-pad regulator. So I won't bore you with the de definitions here. Hopefully you've had a chance to read that. But just to recap, it's a pressure vent. Uh, it's a, it, it, this is the process of pressure relief or uh, venting off the pressure from the tank. Okay, and last but not least on the venting system or on the, on the tank blanketing system is the emergency venting system. And this is probably the most critical piece along the top of our vent structure because this is our last lines of defense. Uh, as you see here, this is, it is the process of controlling the vapor space pressure and or vacuum during unusual or upset conditions. Now, like I said before, we can use a conservation vent, which is the device that you see on the left hand side. Underneath the verbiage, there's two pictures of devices. The one on the left is the conservation vent. The one on the right is what we would call an emergency relief vent or an uh, emergency venting system. The conservation vent can be used for vapor recovery as well, especially if you pipe it away uh, on a pipe, pipe away type system. Commonly, though, we see them vented to atmosphere. But the canister on that particular device there is a relief, uh, is a, uh, relief device that's set to protect the tank from vacuum disruptions. What that means is, let's say we're in a, in a loadout situation where we're unloading the tank. As you're unloading the tank, remember we had, coming back to our two liter bottle of pop uh, example, we're going to start collapsing in the sidewalls of that tank. That's where the blanketing pressure regulator comes into play to make up that pressure to preserve the structure of the tank. Well, let's say we weren't monitoring the, the supply of pressure that we had or nitrogen that we had that we're buying from an external supplier and we ran out of bottled gas or so, our nitrogen supply. Well, we start unloading the tank, we don't have the nitrogen gas to make up, and we start to implode the tank structure. What the canister side does there is that it's an emergency vacuum uh, device that allows uh, atmospheric air to be sucked into the tank so that we can make up that vapor space in a hurry to preserve the tank from imploding. 
Replacing tanks, as you know, can be extremely expensive, not only in the structure of the tank, but the Environmental Protection Agency and uh, other uh, uh, fines that can get involved, especially if we spill uh, liquids, etc. So it's a, it's a nasty event that we're ultimately trying to preserve. On the emergency vent side, this is our last line of defense as well. This is typically comes into play on an overpressure situation where we're filling the tank and let's say we've lost our vacuum pump and our D-pad regulator is unable to keep up or we've plugged uh, the porting of our conservation vent, what have you. It's, a, it's an upset condition. It looks like a weighted manhole cover. That's basically what it is. But it's set at a higher pressure so that when we get to the ultimate maximum allowable working pressure of the tank, or about 10% or so below, this di device will come into play, open up, and allow uh, that venting uh, to occur without losing the tank again. So I mentioned uh, a term called the maximum allowable working pressure. These tanks, coming to the next overhead here, are designed to certain standards. Oh, I'm sorry, I should have clicked that earlier. Let's come this way. Here we go here. This is a nice schematic that's provided by our partners in Ardo who provide emergency uh, relief vents and uh, conservation vents. This is a nice graphic showing how the Anardo equipment comes into play with the emergency vent and the pipe away conservation vent. So as you can see, the tank on this particular device, on this particular schematic, is, is an enclosed tank. There are several standards that tanks are designed to that we have to protect to. There's EN 14015, API 650, API 620. These standards come into play that help us dictate what the maximum allowable working pressure is, which is on the positive side, how much pressure that tank can hold from a positive pressure standpoint before it explodes. And there's also the maximum allowable venting pressure, or I'm sorry, vacuum pressure, which is the imploding uh, uh, parameter that we're trying to protect to. So what you have here are the span between the maximum allowable working pressure and the maximum allowable vacuum pressure. This is the span where we're going to apply our pad, D-pad system, and our venting and emergency venting system, uh, equipment. So we're going to design within these parameters. And you can see by depending upon how the tank was designed and what processors you're using, the size of the tank, the pump in, pump out rates, all these things that come into play will dictate how big that span can be. But that API 650 and EN 14015 put us in a situation where we have to design the equipment to be at a maximum, even in a fire condition, at the maximum allowable working pressure. We cannot exceed that and we cannot exceed the maximum allowable vacuum pressure. API 620 allows you to go over that uh, parameter by 10, even 20 percent in a fire condition, but normally 10 percent. The reason I bring those up is because when we come back to the engineering uh, considerations later, those will be questions that we'll bring up uh, with your engineering teams in designing a tank blanking system so that we can put in the appropriate equipment. Okay, so let's move on to the types of storage tanks that there are. Basically we see three different style of tanks. We have the fixed roof tanks, which are meant for liquids with very high flash points like fuel oils, butamin, uh, etc. They can be cone roofs, dome type roofs, umbrella type roofs. So these are the usual type that we see. And uh, usually they're insulated to prevent the clogging of certain materials. So um, we come into play with the issues of the design parameters as well with these fixed roof tanks. So there will be a lot of design parameters around those as well as taking into account the in-breathing and out-breathing uh, factors that come into play. And those will dictate the thermal expansion and thermal contraction uh, that we have based upon the size of the tank which are dictated by API 2000. So we will use, we will use those types of standards in sizing as well. Fixed roof tanks are where we probably see or we do see the most common tank blanketing or tank blanketing system uh, used. You also have floating roof tanks. The, this is a tank uh, where you have a, a floating roof 
inside the tank that is uh, above the liquid level that you're storing. So there is a, a vapor barrier, but it tends to the vapor barrier tends to be a little bit more constant as the roof uh, moves down as the liquids are being pumped out, and it moves up as the liquids are being pumped in. Uh, the floating roof tanks uh, definitely dis decrease the vapor space above the liquid, so it will decrease the amount of uh, blanketing pressure you're going to be using. And you know you can use these types of tanks in uh, these types of applications that you see here. And then you have an external floating roof tank. Now the external floating roof tank is pretty common in uh, the the uh, the refining type industry and the in the uh, petro industry where we're storing uh, gasoline, fuels, uh, etc. This is where the the actual floating roof is residing on the on the uh, liquid itself and moving along the top. The upper part of the tank is open to atmosphere. Uh, one of the downsides of the external floating roof tank, though, is that you can get vapor to seep out around the seal along the edges, and it can create somewhat of a volatile situation. Uh, we don't use blanketing, or very you know, uncommon to see any type of blanketing system used on external floating roof tanks, if at all. So most commonly we're talking about fixed roof tanks when we're uh, talking about a blanketing system. Okay. Oh, I gotta go back. Sorry about that. Okay. So, getting back to where tank blanketing is used, um, like we like we started the presentation off earlier, we see a lot of usage for tank blanketing, petrochemical, pharmaceutical, chemical industry, and also in the uh, in the oil industry or the refining industry, uh, where they're storing finished product like fuels, fuel treatments. Uh, uh, diesels, etc. But let's just take a quick look here, petrochemical industry, where we see maybe an example of a high temperature oil being stored in an enclosed tank, uh, flammable final products, as well as the chemical industry. This is very, very common for us or in the industry, especially for Novaspec. We get involved quite frequently with the chemical industry providing uh, tank blanketing systems and adhesives and sealants. Uh, solvents, inks, industrial coatings, etc. And then on the pharmaceutical side, uh, we see quite a uh, we see a, quite a bit of uh, request for tank blanketing system protecting the sanitary side of the water for injection uh, tanks and etc. So this tends to be more so for uh, purity, if you will. Okay, so. Here we've come kind of to an area where we've talked about the pad system, the tank blanketing system in general, where we have the padding system, the D-pad system, and the emergency venting system. Those are the three components that, we, uh, that we've talked about around a tank blanketing system. And when we talk about total tank management, we're talking about controlling all the process control around the tank, including the, uh, the valving that might be involved in the inlet and outlet of the pumping digital control system. So the tank blanketing system that we spent most of our time on this morning is on the three components along the top of the tank typically. So now that we've kind of covered the components of tank blanketing, let's talk about why we want to use a tank blanketing type system. So here's some reasons as to why we want to use a, a, a tank blanketing type system and vapor recovery type system, if you will. And I'm using the tank blanketing system to encompass all those three components. So I, if, I, if, it's, if you found that to be a little confusing, I apologize. But the tank blanketing system is all three of those components. So looking at the three main components that we have here, government regulations for one, plant safety and environmental safety, and finished product storage. Uh, these are the three main reasons for doing it. I believe it's intuitive that obviously we're doing it to preserve the structure of the tank. That comes with doing this correctly, is preserving the structure of the tank. But these are the three reasons as to why we would do this as well. So let's look at this a little bit more in detail as to why we would uh, do this from a government standpoint. Government regulations, you have several different parties involved. 
Uh, we've mentioned API uh, earlier, the American Petroleum Institute in terms of their standard for in-breathing and out-breathing being API 2000, 620, 650. Those are involved in tank design and uh, dictate maximum allowable working pressures and vacuum pressures. Obviously, tank blanketing uh, has uh, a lot to do with uh, tank blanketing system has a lot to do with complying with the standards set by API. But you also have uh, factory mutual research. You have UL, which is underwriter laboratories, uh, OSHA, which is obviously the Occupational Safety and Health uh, Department or the Health Act that was uh, developed by uh, uh, the Safety and Health Department. All these parameters come into play. So these regulations are uh, information that you need to adhere to depending upon what it is that your plan is uh, processing, storing, etc. Uh, sorry. My mouse is a little touchy. Uh, secondly, and, and not second in nature, but uh, probably the most important reason is safety. Plant safety, uh, keeping your people safe, keeping the environment safe, uh, your neighbors to your plant in the residential areas potentially safe. Uh, safety is, uh, is a key concern for using blanketing. Uh, we use blanketing in, in to try and minimize the volatility of the vapors that are stored in the tank and preventing them from being uh, creating uh, external explosions as you may see in some of these pictures here. Also just escaping fumes to, uh, to the atmosphere which could be potentially deadly. Um, so, you know, the floating roof tanks tend to be somewhat more susceptible to a lightning strike here or also in uh, uh, an explosion, explosive type of uh, situation because of the fact that they, they don't tend to be uh, bubble tight. Uh, we do find situations where there is some vapor leakage around the seals. And when you have that volatile vapor laying on top there, it's just waiting for an ignition source. Lightning could be one, static electricity, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, blanketing uh, with an inert gas tends to snuff out the oxygen presence and the air presence, which minimizes the explosive nature of the fumes around the tank. And then, you know, third is obviously to preserve the, the um, the fluids that are within the tank from being spoiled. So if you look at the top uh, reasons here, to isolate the tank contents from atmospheric air and moisture, uh, to safeguard the stored product from spoilage of contaminant. This is uh, a real good reason as to use tank blanketing to prevent spoilage and to prevent the, uh, the end product inside the tank from reaching the open markets in uh, good quality condition preserves longer life, higher quality products, less oxidation, etc. Also, as you can see there, it also prevents tank corrosion. So removing the air, obviously, from within the tank, obviously is going to prevent tank corrosion, and corrosion along the internals of the tank obviously lend themselves to spoiling your product as well. Here you have uh, to contain tank vapors, prevent their release to atmosphere, this is reducing emissions, reducing product loss, complying with environmental regulations. That tends to be more of a government regulation. And then you have also the, uh, the, uh, the safety factor below where we're lowering the oxygen content of the vapor space uh, with, the, or the, uh, with the intent of uh, uh, enhancing the safety and eliminating the flammable vapor space around the tank and within the, the, uh, the tank. Okay, so let's talk about engineering the solution. With all that backdrop in mind, we finally get to what the title of this presentation is all about, engineering the solution. So now that we're all experts in tank blanketing systems, and we've all kind of talked through, we're all on the same playing field here, when Novaspec gets a hold of, an, of a request to actually engineer a solution for your tank farm or the one tank that you may have that where you're storing um, uh, very expensive and finished product and critical uh, uh, processing uh, fluids, we, uh, we will consider these eight things that generally come into play. So normally we'll ask you some information about the tank size. 
And this is where, you know, if we can get the specifications on the tank that you have, the API 650 spec that you comply to, or EN 14015 or 620, this will help us with the parameters of the tank in terms of the structure of the tank. How big is the tank in terms of its capacity, the gallon size of the tank, and also uh, the working pressure so that we can start to think about what types of devices we need to put around the tank. Then we have the in-breathing and out-breathing requirements. This again is set by the size of the tank and also dictated by API 2000. So uh, we can refer to charts and, uh, and uh, use that information along with the pump in, pump out rates to figure out how fast the fluid is coming in and leaving the tank as well as how, how much uh, uh, thermal expansion and contraction will get based upon the uh, thermal effects around the tank, based upon its size and the, uh, the flash points of the fluid that are being installed, so uh, being preserved. So those first three dictate around the processing around the tank. Number four, number five are somewhat uh, related in, in that we are trying to get to material selection of the equipment around the tank. So the fluids being stored in the tank, like we stated earlier, uh, having an MSD a sheet info would be very beneficial. This way we can get the right material compatibility on the metal parts, soft parts of the blanketing regulator, the D-pad regulators, the venting, the emergency venting. We want all these pieces that are going to come in contact with the fluid, the vapors, especially potentially the fluid, to be materially compatible with those chemicals. And then we have, last but not least, the controlled uh, blanketing pressure. This is actually deciding where do we want to set our blanketing pressure or our pad pressure. This comes into play with the first three points, especially number one, number two, number three, on pump in, pump out rates in breathing tank size, which again, maximum allowable working pressure and vacuum pressure will help us dictate the controlled blanketing pressure space. And then how accurate do we want that that uh, blanketing pressure to be controlled. And the reason we bring that up is because within those parameters like we spoke about before, the workable pressure and the maximum allowable vacuum pressure, we can, we can decide on the, on the blanketing pressure where we can put those relief devices and vacuum uh, relief devices. The worst thing that we can do is overlap set points. And what I mean by that is when you have a D-pad regulator, conservation vent, vacuum um, uh, protection device. These devices have shutoff pressures and they have what's called receipt pressures. So even though you may have a set point that is close to the blanketing pressure on a D-pad regulator, if the D-pad regulator goes off or is asked to discharge, it generally shuts off at a lower pressure than its set pressure. So not to get into a huge discussion about that, but we need to span these devices uh, away from each other so that their proportional bands around their set pressures don't interfere with one another. If that does occur, what we have is premature loss of uh, nitrogen or carbon dioxide or natural gas. And what the, uh, the issue of that is, is obviously we start to lose, um, uh, we're starting to, we're starting to waste costs. We're starting to waste dollars to atmosphere or to a recovery system prematurely. So to just kind of back that up, using lower pressure uh, nitrogen uh, as a blanketing pressure, like we, our example earlier being a two inch water column, if we can lower that to one inch water column, uh, we can actually use less nitrogen for blanketing over time. We can tighten up our venting uh, system around that blanketing pressure and use a tighter span or control window, which will use less pressure over time, or less nitrogen over time. That translates directly to the bottom line when you're purchasing nitrogen from an outside source. So that's where the cost savings comes in. Okay, so what do we have for some resources? I'll just touch on this briefly. Um, here at NovaSpec, obviously we have our, our Fisher Regulator product line. A lot of the graphics that you saw uh, on the pad, D-pad side came from these devices, that, these uh, material that you see here. We have an industrial regulator handbook as well as a CD that has a lot of good charts and graphics and good information 
to resort to for uh, information. We also have um, uh, our friends at Anardo. We have uh, good information uh, on conservation vents and emergency vents. One piece of equipment that I failed to mention, and I apologize, is uh, the ruptured disc side. I know we talked about the emergency venting disc being the last uh, line of defense. Actually, the ruptured disc, if you install them, is your last line of defense. And we do have also a Zook product line that uh, provides ruptured disc, which would be set beyond the emergency venting. That would come into our window as well of the parameters. We would have to set that in our parameters between our maximum allowable working pressure and maximum allowable venting pressure. So sorry to uh, forget about that particular uh, device around the tank. It is a critical piece uh, that uh, uh, needs some consideration as well. So we've come kind of to the end of the presentation. Um, I'd like to open it up for Q&A. Again, if you have some questions where you you have a detailed question, you'd like to get into a discussion, you can see my email address is there below, as well as my office phone number and cell phone number. Again, my name is uh, Jeff Wallendowski, and uh, I appreciate your time this morning.